Hi everyone, I'm Tim from Tim Stepping Out. Uh, today, this video marks the beginning of a multi-part series that I'm calling the Jesus Myth Series, where I will argue on behalf of mythicism uh, as opposed to historicity of Jesus Christ. In this video series, I'll make references to early Christian texts, both orthodox and heretical, and I'll also refer quite heavily to the heresiologists of the um, early centuries of Christianity uh, to make logical inferences based on what I think is an honest interpretation of the data, uh, which is specifically that Jesus Christ didn't exist. Rather, I think he was a composite of uh, a lot of other figures, both um, real and, and fictional. But this first video uh, is an argument about why I think Jesus Christ and Simon Magus were probably at least partially one and the same person. Jesus Christ, I think, became a composite of Simon Magus along with other um, early Christians, many of whom I think um, would be now considered heretical. Uh, but at the time, there was no such thing really as heretical. It was just <laughs> um, a, a person who I think was ad advancing or advocating for this mysterious spirit and the knowledge of this spirit uh, would come once uh, people were deeper initiated into the Christian mystery or whatever it was called back then. It was probably the Nazarene mystery or something like that. So a little bit of background on Simon the Magician. He was said to be a magician from Samaria, some 40 miles from Jerusalem. He was supposedly active in the mid-first century. There, were, con there was contention for centuries regarding the location of the holiest site uh, for Jewish people um, for centuries between people who lived in Jerusalem or people who revered Jerusalem and people who revered Samaria and Mount Gezrim. Uh, so for Jerusalem Jews, Samaritans were an easy and obvious enemy. Someone, uh, people who were easily um, polemicized. And I think that that's what happened um, throughout the early centuries of Christianity. In terms of who might be candidates for um, the early Jerusalem sect, I think it's the Ebionites. So Irenaeus wrote of the Ebionites, so Judaic in their style of life that they even adore Jerusalem as if it were the house of God. This is from Against Heresies, book one. Uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, which was for a time used by the Ebionites and probably contributed to by the Ebionites at some point, uh, in Matthew 10:5, Jesus said, uh, do not go onto the road of the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. So the implication here is that there was a sect or sects who used the gospel of Matthew who hated the Samaritans. Right? That's what we can take from when Jesus says something. When words are put into Jesus' mouth, Jesus is advocating the agenda of the author. And I think that once you start to look at Christian literature like that, it becomes a lot easier to sort of filter through um, what those agendas were. So this Simon the Magician, uh, who was written about quite extensively, it would have been convenient for, for them to call him a Samaritan, regardless of whether or not that was true. The Gospels of Luke and John, however, uh, which probably came after Matthew, um, at least um, much of them. I mean, it could be that there was a proto-gospel kind of um, splicing into these gospels, but I think clearly Luke is reading Matthew and Mark. Um, John is, I think, a little bit more of a complex beast, so I'll stay away from that here. But those gospels, Luke and John, treat Samaritans better, right? So the implication there is that those gospel writers did not hold as much hostility towards Samaria as the Matthew author. And so this could be that time had passed, politics had changed, or I think most likely uh, 
is that there were different sects who felt differently about Jerusalem and Samaria. So Acts of the Apostles recounts a story where Simon Magus's exploits attracted the attention of Peter and John, and they went to Samaria to observe Simon. Simon asks Peter if he can buy the spirit, which allowed Peter to heal the sick. Peter rebukes Simon, saying, may you perish with your money. In the subsequent centuries, a curious number of polemics were written about Simon, from the earliest apologies of Justin Martyr to Irenaeus some 30 years later to Tertullian um, a couple decades after that, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, Origen, Jerome, all these, all these early church fathers were writing extensively about Justin or um, about Simon Magus. So these church fathers, among other things, claimed Simon was the father of all heresies and that the other heretical sects were branches of the Simonian system. Simon was said to have a disciple named Menander, who was also a Samaritan. Although some differences between Menander and Simon can be teased out, those differences were negligible. But I think the core Simon is found in Irenaeus. Irenaeus writes, Simon then, not putting faith in God a whit the more, set himself eagerly to contend against the apostles in order that he might seemed to be a wonderful being, and applied himself with still greater zeal to study of the whole magic art, that he might the better bewilder and overpower multitudes of men. This man, then, was glorified by many as if he were a god, and he taught that it was he himself who appeared among the Jews as the son, but descended in Samaria as the father, while he came to other nations in the character of the Holy Spirit. He represented himself in a word as being the loftiest of all powers. This is from Against Heresies, uh, Book 1, Chapter 23. So the first impression I think we can draw from Irenaeus's statement uh, is the phrase, he set himself eagerly to contend against the apostles. So this is the picture we get from Acts of the Apostles as well, uh, but it sounds curiously like Paul. Consider Galatians 2, 6 to 9. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So we have this dichotomy here that Paul describes in Galatians, but it seems to echo the relationship that Simon has to other apostles. The Dutch radical school of the late 19th and early 20th century advanced the theory that Simon Magus and Paul were one and the same, along with the idea that Paul did not author his epistles at all, that he was a fiction. This theory was resurrected by the late Hermann Dettering in the late 20th century and has been since ad advocated by Robert M. Price. Uh, in my mind, the idea that Simon and Paul are the same and that Paul was a fiction are not entirely incompatible if we assume that there were texts emerging out of these Simonian communities that um, that were advancing an idea that were popular and that would have later needed to have been integrated into the orthodoxy. Those sects which the church fathers claimed were branches of Simonianism, uh, if you look closely, you'll find that they actually revered Paul. This includes the Valentinians and Marcionites, both of whom were accused of being Simonians, but actually used and revered Paul. One of the remarkable things about what Irenaeus writes when he says, himself who appeared among the Jews as the son, descended in Samaria as the father, other nations in the character of the Holy Spirit, is that this is a remarkable um, pre-Trinity idea. Uh, 
where you have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all being manifest in Simon. If this is true, this is uh, remarkable, and given that the Trinity was not fully developed in Christianity until after Nicene, or at least in the years leading up to it, but certainly well after the second century. So in the phrase that Irenaeus writes, he taught that it was himself who appeared among the Jews as the son, but descended in Samaria as the father, while he came to other nations in the character of the Holy Spirit. What we see here is inklings of this adoptionism, which is detectable in Mark's gospel. So in Mark, there was no virgin birth, rather a spirit descended onto Jesus in the form of a dove. Later, Mandean John the Baptist literature describes this dove as the lower feminine spirit Ruha, which was a malevolent spirit, but which, which was nonetheless a spirit which emanated from above and manifest on earth. A noteworthy aside here is that the spirit was probably at least in my opinion, the feminine counterpart of the otherwise masculine uh, pre-Trinity idea. But this adoptionism was indeed the earlier iteration, later supplanted by the virgin birth. The orthodoxy, which was uh, in this case Catholicism, eventually merged Gnostic and Orthodox theologies in the Gospel of John, which converts Jesus into the Logos, the mechanism by which the material realm is created. Uh, of course, this is a drastic rethinking of the Genesis creation, but uh, the orthodoxy kept all these disparate ideas in their canon despite the incompatibility of all of them. Uh, adoptionism versus virgin birth versus this whole logos creation mechanism. They're all very different and um, not particularly compatible. But, of course, what I think is that these compatibilities eventually give rise to modern Christian denominational differences and probably denominational differences all along the way uh, in terms of preference for texts and things like that. Uh, Martin Luther, the, the, you know, the early Protestant Reformation leader, uh, he hated the Epistle of James, for example. <laughs> and of course, uh, when you read the Epistle of James, it's not easy to see why. James uh, is almost specifically calling out Pauline epistles, uh, saying what's wrong with them. One thing to consider in what Irenaeus is saying here uh, in terms of Simon appearing to the Jews uh, as the son, but descended in Samaria as the father, is that Simon is playing multiple roles depending on geography. He contends with the other apostles, probably adjusting his role depending on how entrenched the current power hierarchy was given the particular geographic locale he was in. One thing I would point out here is that the term apostle is not the same as disciple. Uh, disciple is the preferred term in the Gospels, but if you read Paul, you'll find he doesn't use the term apostle or disciple. He uses the term apostle. A disciple is a student, but an apostle is a messenger. The conclusion I take from this is that there were multiple players in the apostle game. None served a master other than themselves although there was seeming reverence to earlier generations, at least from what we can tell based on the texts that remain. But the currency for these apostles was the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, 18 to 19, it says, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. F.C. Bauer pointed out a parallel in Galatians 2, where Paul was to be recognized as an apostle, and the only requirement was that he should remember the poor, an allusion to providing money for the Jerusalem Christians. One thing to point out here is that Ebion translates to poor in Hebrew. So when 
Paul says all that they asked was that we remember the poor, he's saying all that they asked is that we remember the Ebionites. So this gives rise, I think, to an alternate paradigm, an alternate way of thinking about early Christianity. And that is that Jesus is a composite of these apostles. Uh, that is to say, Paul, Peter, James, other ones who may have been fictions in themselves, but had traditions associated with them. There was no need for the first purveyor of the Holy Spirit. This movement emerged from an earlier movement which had similar concern for this Holy Spirit or the proto version of such. Eventually, this spirit would become encapsulated within a single human being, and that human being was, at least in the literature, called Jesus Christ. The transfer of ownership of this spirit became so contentious that by the time the Gospel of John was canonized, it had to be ex explicitly codified. So the subsequent recipient of this spirit would be the comforter or the paraclete. And of course, this idea had existed uh, as early as the Gospel of Mark and probably earlier than that as well. Uh, in uh, one of the Corinthians, Paul says, I think it's 1 Corinthians, he says, uh, don't you realize that you are the temple and the spirit is within your midst? Uh, so, of course, uh, if we presume that the Pauline letters, at least some version of them, precede the Gospels, then uh, what we have is that the, this spirit is, is preceding the Gospels as well, this idea of the Holy Spirit. So if we look to find the origins of it, we can see that many Old Testament texts, especially the later apocalyptic ones, leave room for this notion that spirits inhabit people, places, and even animals. And of course, the Gospel of Mark has demon-infested pigs and people and other things like that. Second Esdras, which is a late first century compilation of Ezra literature, describes Ezra exploring the field encountering a grieving woman with ashes on her head, lamenting the loss of her son. The angel Uriel explains to Ezra that the woman, who in the story converted the field into the holy city, represented Zion, and the son she was lamenting uh, represented the first temple. The grieving woman who became the city in Second Esdras rings very similar to the woman standing on the sun in Revelation 12. She gives birth to the Messiah. She was chased out of heaven and into the wilderness. And of course, dragons tend not to chase star-crowned pregnant women out of heaven, so a more celestial concern is obvious here. This is not earthly. This is a concern for what is happening in the heavens. The, wom the woman later returned in Revelation 21, although not explicitly named, but in Revelation, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for her husband. So this, is, um, this I think, is pretty obvious when you're following from Revelation 12 to Revelation 21. The woman uh, in heaven who was chased by a dragon is replaced by the scarlet-clad harlot uh, who who takes her place, but is eventually uh, removed from power as well. So this woman, I think, is very clearly and evidently the second temple, and she was uh, ushered in uh, by Babylon, so to speak. And if you know the history of uh, at least what the tradition says about the second temple and its origins, uh, you'll see that it's a very obvious idea. So what we see in Revelation is some hostility towards what is going on in the Second Temple period, and uh, a, a later video will discuss uh, more about that. But in the second century, we see an emerging concern for the return of the Holy City, the New Jerusalem. This is not unexpected because such concern was evident during the pre-Second Temple period as well, but the field here is significant. Uh, Ezra is in the field, and he encounters the woman grieving in the field, and the field becomes the holy city. So the field becomes the new Jerusalem. Uh, 
one of the things you'll note in Mark 15, 21, as Simon of Cyrene is compelled to carry Jesus Christ's cross, he makes, uh, he's plucked from the field. Uh, rolling back in Mark, we see that there's, I think, a connection between Simon of Cyrene here and what Jesus says in Mark 9, 35, where he says, anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. So Simon of Cyrene, bearing Christ's cross, is Jesus' last servant. He's doing this on behalf of Jesus, presumably because Jesus is uh, exhausted or something like that, but Simon is serving Jesus. Uh, but the common translation here is that Simon's taken from the country by Roman soldiers, but the Greek term actually used is agru, uh, country is not the proper translation for this term. The better translation is field or agricultural land. Obviously, agru is a source for what we get agriculture from. So we're talking about farmland, but we're talking about a field. And in other places in the New Testament, this term is uh, usually translated as field. This field is an, an important aspect of the Gospel of Mark. And as usual, um, the translators have done Mark a disservice in terms of his original meaning, but of course, we can understand why. <laughs> so, in the moments after Mark 9.35, John, who was explicitly cast as an apostle in the story, complains of an anonymous demon caster who is proselytizing in Jesus' name. Mark says that, Jesus renders his authority explicitly to grant demon casting abilities. He does so earlier in Mark. So this enhances the notion that there are rogue apostles who are advocating uh, for the Holy Spirit. A physical association with Jesus was not necessary. And indeed, if you think about this, it seems quite likely that Mark probably didn't need uh, the paraclete or the proto-paraclete to have a physical association with Jesus. Uh, this raises the likelihood, I think, that Mark um, has a deep respect for uh, the subsequent paraclete as opposed to a, a necessarily a concern for Jesus. But it also, I think, uh, reinforces this idea that the Holy Spirit is the currency. It's what's important here. Not the man, not Jerusalem citizenship, not connection with Jesus, but the ownership of the Holy Spirit or the current, uh, current connection to the Holy Spirit. But what this means, I think, is that Mark 9, 35 to 40 is foreshadowing, and it's foreshadowing Simon of Cyrene. The anonymous demon caster will be the last of the apostles, the one who wasn't explicitly granted authority, and the one who joined the movement later, accidentally perhaps. So this, is, this I think, is a clear allusion to Paul. Paul in Galatians 6 says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This is a remarkable thing to say. Um, why wouldn't he... Paul doesn't seem to be aware of a gospel tradition here. He's got an idea of a cross, but the world has been crucified to him and him to the world. He doesn't have a need for a historical crucifixion. The cross Paul refers to as metaphorical and probably part of a deeper mystery. Irenaeus tells us that the early Gnostic group, the Basilidians, believed that Simon of Cyrene was the recipient of this Christ spirit when Jesus died. Other traditions have Simon taking Jesus' place as Jesus escaped. Uh, I'll talk about that more as well. I think that this is probably a reference to a historical person as well, but I have to, I have to limit my tangents here. But coming back to Simon of Cyrene, he was the recipient of the Spirit. He was newly adopted, plucked from the field where seeds are planted. 
So we this helps to explain, I think, the recurring seed tropes throughout early Christian texts, the mustard seed and whatnot. But the field would be the New Jerusalem, and Christians would be the seeds planted in the field. That is to say, Christians should be going to the New Jerusalem. This is their new um, this is the, their new holy land. But the spirit moves presumably within the sect, and the subsequent recipient becomes the new Christ. The Christ is the one purporting wisdom, not the shell man in which the spirit is encapsulated. Therefore, we can think of early Christian figureheads as composites of each other, fluid, changeable, depending on the agenda, the time, and the person. Simon of Cyrene was an outsider, unknown before the crucifixion, yet he received the Spirit and would thus be affected by it as Jesus was. Consider 1 Corinthians in this context. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when he, is, when he called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. So Simon of Cyrene, I think, in this context, is Christ's slave. He is a slave to the Spirit. It's easy to understand why some of Paul's followers were so adamant about Paul's authority in this context, despite his never meeting Jesus in real life. Uh, Marcion, Marcion of Sinope was said to have completely disregarded the other apostles entirely, relying, relying entirely on Pauline epistles and perhaps a gospel. Consider a different paradigm. The earliest Christians were spirit seekers looking for the new Jerusalem, or perhaps trying to populate it. And they were also looking for who owns the Holy Spirit. In this context, if they didn't know who the previous generation's Christ encapsulator was, they might have looked to history books to try to find them, to try to find people acting entirely out of the ordinary, uh, acting insane, acting as uh, was described uh, of Jesus in Mark 3, where his family wanted to lock him up because they thought he had gone crazy. This is the sort of personality traits early Christians would have been looking for if they had gone to the history books to try to find Jesus Christ in earlier generations. So the real star of the show, given these details, is Simon of Cyrene. If you think about how Mark's gospel would have read to the Basilidians, who probably used a gospel similar to Mark, the whole story is leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. The spirit transfers to Simon of Cyrene. The, crucifix is the, or the crucifixion is the climax, and as Jesus dies, the spirit transfers, which is why he can finally accept the gall on the cross. Uh, the spirit is gone, and Jesus no longer needs to remain sinless by perhaps uh, holding to the Nazarite oath, which is essentially an abstinence from any grape products. Simon then inherits the spirit and becomes the new Jesus Christ. So Simon is the star here, the new celebrity who continues the work of Jesus Christ. There's no need to worry anymore because the spirit now resides on earth, no longer stifled uh, by the temple veil, which was torn as Jesus died on the cross and which had formerly uh, separated the Holy of Holies and the temple, which only the high priest could access. And only then it was once a year. This was the high priest's access to heaven and God. Now that veil is gone. Now there is no more limitation preventing God from accessing the earth. Therefore, Jesus was the vehicle to transfer the spirit to Simon. Simon is the real star here. Let's move back in Mark and consider another curious parallel. In Mark 7.24, Jesus goes to Tyre in Lebanon. This is an incredibly 
inefficient route some 50 miles out of the way, often used to poke fun at uh, what appears to be Mark's ignorance about the geography. But I propose a different solution. Jesus went to Tyre to check a bullet point off the reader's list. In Against Heresies 1.23, Irenaeus writes, Simon, having redeemed from slavery at Tyre, a city of Phoenicia, a certain woman named Helena, he was in the habit of carrying her about with him. So in the scene in Mark 7, a Greek woman, right after he arrives, asks Jesus to cure his daughter. So this is one of the more famous scenes in the New Testament and is repeated across the Gospels. Uh, Jesus uh, gives a quite a nasty response saying, why should I... Uh, give scraps to the dogs when the children are hungry. And the woman responds with a clever quip. Jesus cures her daughter instantly. But the Greek woman in, in Greek is Helena. So I think that this woman is actually a pointer to Simon's Helena. Jesus goes to Tyre because the author wanted the reader to connect Jesus Christ to the stories associated with Simon Magus. And this is why uh, this is why these things are happening in the story. Consider Matthew's redactions in this context. The Gospel of Luke and Matthew rely much on the Gospel of Mark. There are only a few times where stories in Mark are not repeated in Matthew or Luke. Uh, this is why we know that Matthew and Luke rely so heavily on Mark and not the other way around, although there are all kinds of different solutions to this problem, which is called the synoptic problem. But two of those non-referenced passages are in Mark 7 and Mark 8, the same area where Jesus goes to Tyre. He's healing sick people with his saliva. This healing practice would have been common for first century magicians, uh, but would have been quite, uh, quite disgusting probably to a Jew who disdains these sorts of practices. Therefore, we can assume Mark is intimate with a community culture which had no such qualms about these practices, probably somewhere in the diaspora outside of Jerusalem. But the inescapable conclusion to which we must arrive is that Mark's Jesus was a magician. And this, I think, reinforces the idea that Mark had a very particular magician in mind when he was crafting the persona of Jesus Christ. Many New Testament characters appear to be composites of various characters, sometimes biblical, sometimes historical. But Josephus relays a story of a magician who was named Adamus, but this name is sometimes translated as Simon. This Simon aided Felix the procurator to convince Herodian princess Drusilla to divorce her husband and marry Felix instead. Again, this would have been quite disdainful for Jews, but maybe a little less concerning perhaps for um, someone in the diaspora. But this convincing may have been part theological. Perhaps Simon was a fast talker and was good at convincing people. But I think that it was at least in part from magic potions. Why otherwise would Felix enlist the help of a magician and not uh, someone who has a higher status. Magicians could make magical potions, which were love potions. Josephus never explicitly says this, of course, uh, but this question has not been convincingly explored either. But Irenaeus of Lyon makes several references to love potions in the heretical communities which were supposedly influenced by Simonian followers. Uh, the Simonians, Irenaeus says, use exorcisms and incantations, love potions too, and charms. Of Marcus the Magician, who was supposedly a Valentinian, uh, he com uses compounds, filters, and love potions in order to insult the persons of some of these women, 
and the Carpocratians, who I think are convincingly described as uh, Marcionites, practice also magical arts and incantations, fil filters also on love potions. So Jews reading this would have had um, a pretty negative view of this, but again, I think that people stepping outside the bounds of Judaism or who never grew up in such a rigid culture might not have had such uh, reaction to it. But one thing to point out is that Simon or Adamus was a Cypriot, and I think that this is important and referenced later. So Acts of the Apostles is considered a fictional telling. Uh, it seems to have had memory of history, often overlapping Josephus's accounts. I won't bother to go into that. I think it's fairly self-evident, although uh, religious apologists and whatnot are, uh, feel pretty hostile towards this idea. Uh, again, I think that it's fairly self-evident that Luke and Acts rely quite extensively on Josephus. But consider Acts 11, 19 through 20. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen, who was James, uh, was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Later in Acts 13, we, we see a blurb where it says, Now in the church at Antioch, where again the Cypriot and Cyrenian Christians went to preach to the Gentiles, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called the Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan. From Acts 11, we know that Simon must have either been from Cyprus or Cyrene. So if he was from Cyrene, then he's simply Simon of Cyrene. If he was from Cyprus, then he is a pointer to Felix's magician. Given the fictional underpinning of Acts, it's conceivable that the Simon in Acts 13 was both. And indeed, I think he was. So in Acts 13, we have a variety of characters, including Simon, Barnabas, and Saul. Saul and Barnabas separate from the others and landed on Paphos. They met Sergius Paulus, an assistant to the proconsul, as well as the Jewish sorcerer and false prophet Bar-Jesus, which translates to son of Jesus. So F.C. Bauer proposed that Paul takes his name from Sergius Paulus in order to evidence that Saul had a right to bear the title apostle to the Gentiles. If this is, a case, if this is the case, then Paul is little more than a title. But Saul, who is called Paul, blinds the sorcerer for several days. And so this is clearly a reworking of the Saul story where he was struck blind by a vision in Damascus um, while he was persecuting Christians. So Acts here is clearly recasting Paul as an enemy of Jewish sorcerers as opposed to what was probably, he was the inspiration for the fictional version of him. In the preaching of Peter, which is an Ebionite text and perhaps contemporary with, with the Gospels and Acts, Peter debates Simon about visions and says, whoever has a vision ought to recognize that he is the dupe of an evil demon. But compare that to Acts 9, 3-7, where Paul goes blind. So Saul neared Damascus on his journey. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless because they heard the sound but didn't see anyone. So clearly Paul is having an, a vision. And by the way, Jesus Christ is saying, why do you persecute me? Well, isn't Jesus dead here? Uh, that's very strange that he would refer to himself in terms of being persecuted when it's really others. Unless, of course, this me is simply the Christ spirit who is... Um, in the midst of Christians. Uh, another parallel to consider from the pseudo-Clementines, Simon says to Peter, for before my mother Rachel and he came together, she still a virgin conceived me while it was in my power to be either small or great, and 
and to appear as a man among men. So what's interesting here is that Paul was said to have had small stature. So I, this could have been Simon explaining why, why he was small. Uh, but he's also claiming here to have been born of a virgin birth, just like Jesus was. And of course, in opposition, I think, to what Ebionites would have liked, as, as Irenaeus points out throughout against heresies, they, they didn't believe in the virgin birth. In the same homilies, Peter says, For I should wish to know of what character and what conduct he is that we may eat with him. How much more is it proper for us to ascertain who or what sort of man he is to whom the words of immortality are to be committed? So there's special words that, that uh, get chanted, and that is, uh, that is your entry into the Christian mystery. For we ought to be careful, yea, extremely careful, that we cast not our pearls before swine. So he's saying here that we have to be careful before we eat with Simon. Compare that to Galatians 2, where Paul complains that uh, Cephas no longer eats with the Gentiles. So this is a remarkable parallel, and uh, it gives rise to a, uh, a schism between Paul and Peter, which is um, more dramatized in the homilies. So, in conclusion... There's little need to assume any of these traditions are actually historical. Uh, what they are are revealing specific subtext and sets of concerns rather than describing actual historical events. Uh, there were a series of power grabs, clearly. That's detectable in the orthodoxy, but it's also detectable in, in other texts as well. But the question was, who should be the next Christ? And the answer, of course, is the paraclete. But then the question becomes, who is the paraclete? Different gospels had different claims about who this should be. But the church eventually settled on both ideas. Peter becomes the first pope, and Simon is begrudgingly admitted and recast as Paul. Jesus is simply a composite of these figures, and eventually it becomes useful to craft a narrative around his humanity despite sparse evidence for it. So that's all I have to say today. Thanks.